All right, level three, we're going to take a look at DC construction of machines. Particularly, we're going to start with the DC generators, although the motors we're going to find out are built almost the exact same way. We're going to start with taking a look at the insides of these things, then we're going to go and transfer that to the outsides. You know, we're going to start just kind of for the central core, working our ways through. First thing that we're going to do is have a little bit of terminology. There is going to go and be two main terms that you are going to go in here again and again. They don't list them up front over here, but they are going to go and be stator and rotor. Uh, stator is going to go and be the stationary part of the machine. So what we would go and refer to as the frame, the yoke, the end bells, the bearings, all of that stuff is going to be part of my stator. The rotor is going to be the part that is going to go and rotate inside of any sort of a machine. Uh, ro rotor and stator can be different types of windings off them. Sometimes we're going to go and make uh, put magnets onto the rotor and twist them around inside of a stator. That's going to just have coils of wires. Other times we're going to put the magnets on the stator and we're going to have our windings that are going to be twisting through the center. We can use either one, depends upon what the application is going to go and be. But anytime that I'm talking about the stator, I'm going to be talking about the stationary outside part of the motor. Anytime I'm talking about the rotor, I'm going to be talking about the inside part of the motor. And these terms are going to go and carry through into AC machines as well, stator and rotor. DC machines were originally called dynamos uh, because one of the very first things that we did before we started to create motors is we had to go and create electricity. And one of the ways that that was done was by rotating a dynamo. And a dynamo was going to go and have magnetic poles that were going to be glued to the outside. It was just going to be a bunch of wire that was rotated through the inside. And then we would go and get that EG is equal to BLV. We would be able to generate values of voltage, which we could then go and create currents off of. Occasionally, we will still hear people refer to them as dynamos. Uh, but dynamo is much less a common term these days. You'll probably hear it more referred to inside of like X-Men than you ever will inside of actual motor theory. My DC generators and DC motors are going to be built in the same way except for the enclosures, what the stator is going to be. For a lot of my machines that are going to be generators, they're not going to be placed inside of incredibly dirty, dusty, terrible locations. So they're usually going to be open so that I have access to my components, to my connections, that I can maintain them, and so that I can get proper amount of airflow over top of them so that they can go and cool down. In contrast to that, our DC motors are going to usually be placed into dirty service, right? We're going to have them inside of our mills and our mines and everything else that's out there, which means that we are going to go and need to have sealed units so that we don't take the crud of the working world and put it to the inside of our machines. Other than that major difference, the construction is the same. I can take a generator and I can hook it up to electricity and it'll go and become a motor. I can take a motor and I can rotate the shaft and it will become a generator. Both of these are going to be able to work as each other, not always as effectively. Purpose-built motors are still going to have a higher efficiency as a motor than as a generator and vice versa, but they are going to be interchangeable. Let's start by describing the rotor inside of our machine. Uh, the armature is going to be part of our machine. machine. We're going to call it the armature, which is more of a term for DC. Armature core is going to be the metallics that are going to be the inside. It's going to be a laminated core over here that's going to be made up of multiple levels that are, are layers of metal that are going to be stacked together onto a shaft. We're going to press fit them down onto there with layers of varnish in between them. Uh, and the reason that we are going to go and laminate them is just to go and prevent any currents. We are going to be generating AC on side of a DC machine, but then we're going to take that AC and we're going to go and convert it to DC on the way out of the machine. So because we are actually generating AC inside of the machine uh, and then converting it to DC on the output, we will have all of our AC losses, the shred losses that we have talked about before. Uh, skin effect, hysteresis, radiation, eddy current, and dielectric, all of those are going to be apparent inside of these. So we just have to go and build these things for those same reasons. We laminate so that the eddy currents cannot go and rotate around like that. We'll have a shaft that's going to be usually steel. Uh, it's going to be a harder type of material, lower amount of eddy currents. We're not going to laminate it, but because it's got a much higher resistance, we're going to go and drop our amount of eddy currents inside of there. We'll go and place the thing on bearings, and then we are usually going to go and have what's going to be referred to as keyways. And keyways are going to be little square sections that are going to be milled into the shaft that allow us to go and couple and tie components onto it. We can slide like a you know pulley over top of this, and as we do that, the pulley itself is going to go and have that same keyway inside of it. 
And here's my, here's my pull inside of the pulley. My shaft would look very similar. It's gonna look like that. It's also gonna have a milled shot slot. And then when I place these together, the last thing I'm gonna do is line that up and then I drive in what's called the key from the end. The key is just going to go and prevent whatever's on the outside, my pulley on the outside from rotating past that shaft. What we will do is we will go and take this core, once we've built the laminated core, we're then going to go and take windings of wire. They're not usually going to be wound around this while it's actually in place. Usually those windings are gonna be made separately. We'll have a machine with a jig, we'll make a bunch of windings and then we'll take those windings and we will just drop them over. We will press them over top of each of these. Uh, a lot of cases, they're gonna be separate ones and then the ends are just gonna be soldered together inside of the machine. Although at times you will have ones that are contiguous all the way through as well. What we do once we actually get them inside of there is we will go and wedge them in place because centrifugal uh, motion or centripetal motion would actually be the more correct one for this is going to tend to want to go and pull to the outside of this as it goes around. We do need to make sure that those things stay inside. And so what they'll get is they'll just get a small wedge that is then going to go and push this thing. So we got the gap for the stator and we have all of our wires that are just gonna get shoved by this little plastic wedge tight into there. Altogether, we're gonna go and build up a complete armature that's gonna look something like this. Over here, you can see a couple sections. Uh, this section over here is gonna be my laminated steel core. You can see the little laminations on it. They're pretty small and hard to see. Uh, then we're going to go and have our individual coils, which are gonna be all of these. You can see that they're wound with a little bit of paper around them. And then that coil is looping around. It's not going to the next bar, it's going to a couple bars further down because it's a type of winding that we're using on there that we are going to go and refer to as being a lapped winding. A lapped winding that shows uh, one of our lapped windings, the next lapped winding would go up and through like this. Then we would go and have another lapped winding that would go down and through like this, through the next gap, etc. They're gonna be overlapped is what they are going to go and be. Um, Three main types that we are going to go and have. The lap windings are gonna be used in high current and low voltage applications because what I'm gonna have is I'm gonna have each section of these that's going to go and come out to what's gonna be a commutator section. We're gonna to refer to that in a minute, but each one is going to go individually out there. The wave windings are gonna be used in low current but high voltage. We drop more voltage across it because my wave winding is going to actually go through from one end to the other. So I'm going to go in, and it's gonna be a series winding that's gonna come in and come out like that across there. The other one that we do have is called the frog leg. Uh, it's used for kind of a combination, not too high of voltage, not too high of current. And it is going to be made up out of a winding that has got both lap and wave uh, components. So there's gonna be small waves that are then going to be overlapped with each other like, like this. So that's our armature. Um, like we had mentioned in the previous one there, you're gonna go and have that shaft that the thing's gonna be supported on. And you can see that they've got the end bells and the bearings. That's gonna be my bearings right over here that this thing is gonna be mounted on. And then we're gonna go and have another component over here that we're gonna take a look at in a second that is gonna be called the commutator. Let's take a look at the commutator in a little bit more depth over here. Oh, sorry, one more illustration just before we move on. This one isn't in your binders. It's from one older one, but it's just a nicer, uh, you know, drawing of these things shows a bit more detail. Commutator over here, you can see that it's made out of a pile of insulated shafts, insulated uh, horizontal pieces. We're going to go and have our actual armature coils, and you can see the way that they're winding across from one component to another inside of here. Okay, let's take a look at the commutator itself. It is an assembly meaning that's made up of many parts of individually insulated copper bars or segments. They're not gonna be pure copper, they're usually gonna be a hardened type of copper. They're gonna mix it with a few other impurities because these are going to be what we refer to as a wearing surface or a surface that something is going to go and rub along. They're gonna be insulated from each other and from the actual shaft itself. So looking at this, you can sort of see it inside of this one. It's not the clearest picture in the world, but you can see that the individual copper component has got a profile that looks like that. That profile is really what's going to be my copper bar. And I'm gonna have individual copper bars that are gonna look like that. They're gonna get shoved into this larger block. This larger block over here is there just to support them. They've got this wedge shape on the bottom so that centrifugal force does not go and pull them out. And this insulating block that is here on the bottom, um, well, it's gonna be insulating. It's gonna prevent these things from shorting to the shaft or shorting to each other. 
In between each of the layers, we're also going to go and run a layer of insulation. You can see that right over here. There's a little insulation layer in between each one of these and another little insulation layer in between the next one, etc. So each one is going to be individually isolated from each other. Usually this is going to be done through the use of a mineral. It's called mica. Mica gets used for all sorts of stuff or miculite insulation, things like that. And it's got really excellent uh, electrical insulating properties. So we will go and use that mica inside of here. The other thing that I want to just point out over here is you see uh, there's that little slot, just a short little slot on each of those bars. That's just a cut that's inside there. They take the armature wire, wires, those armature wires get shoved into here and then they just crimp that cut shut to go and lock those things in place. They don't trust, you know, a lot of other type of connections to not pull apart under the constant strain that they have because of centrifugal force. Okay, so what is the purpose of the commutator, the purpose of the commutator is it is going to go and take the AC that is generated inside of here. It will generate AC. We're going to go and see that later on. It is going to take that AC and it is going to go and act as if it is a rotary switch. And it is going to be used to maintain my direction of current. So it's a rotary switch. What we're going to do is it is going to go and switch over. When we get to that axis there, it's going to switch over. And really what it's going to do is it's going to move this whole section up to the top over there, which means that now this section will be going like that. And then it's going to take the next section, which would automatically have been going down, and it's going to go and flip that one back up to the top so that we have got this again. So it removes all of our bottom sides, and it's just going to leave us with this pulsating DC that is going to go and come out of these ones. It is a rotary switch that is designed to maintain direction of one of two things on a DC machine. If it is being used as a generator, it is going to maintain direction of current. I should actually write these out so that you guys don't screw them up later on, but we're going to cover motors here tomorrow, so let's take a look at them all right now. Uh, commutator for a generator. It maintains direction of current out. That's what it'll do inside of a uh, genset. And inside of a motor, because remember these things are built the same way, what it is going to do is it's going to be taking current in and it is going to go and maintain direction of my magnetic fields. We'll see that later on once we get into motors, but it is always used as a maintain type of thing. It's either maintaining the current output or it is going to be maintaining a consistent, you know, north-south or something like that that I will be able to go and utilize to drive my stuff inside of a motor. Because it is a rotary switch, we are going to go and have to make contact with it somehow. And in the uh, the motors and the generators themselves, we're going to go and utilize this thing that is going to be recalled our brushes off of here. And this over here shows a brush holder. Now, it's really hard to see the actual brushes. What I'm seeing here in the back is going to go and be my commutator. The brush itself is going to be a small block that is going to be pushed in the back of this. And then this section over here is going to be a spring that is just pushing down. It's maintaining, you know, one or two PSI of pressure on there. Not a lot of PSI, just enough that the thing is going to stay on there and not bounce around. The brushes are what are going to go and allow this thing to go and carry my current uh, into a motor or out of a generator because we have to make that continuous contact with it. Here's another uh, better cutaway of what a commutator would go and look like. They're showing, once again, we've got that same insulating material, the mica that's, that's our underside over there, and then they've got the actual commutator bars themselves that are going to be on here. If I look at my commutator from the end, uh, let's draw the commutator real quick, it's going to be made up of all of these individual small segments together, and my brush is going to go and be a block of soft material that is going to get placed up against here it's going to have pressure this is that psi that we were talking about one to two psi on my brush holder that's going to get pressed up against a brush over there and up against a brush over here and these are then going to be able to ride up against it now the 
type of material that we're going to use, we want it to go and be slippery and conductive. And so one of our best ones to go and use is going to go and be graphite bases. We'll take that graphite and we might combine it with carbon, we might combine it with copper or any other impurities that are going to go and make it a little bit harder because graphite is soft. That's the same stuff that we call leads inside a pencil. That's actually graphite. Uh, it conducts electricity, but it's also really, really slippery. We'll use it as dry lubricant for industrial types of applications, powdered graphite. So it's a slippery substance that is going to ride up against here, which means it's not going to wear down my actual commutator bars. Do you remember how we have got these lap windings that are going to go and be associated? Look how they're cutting almost all the way across. If you take a look at where these things are coming out onto my commutator, what you're going to see is that they're going to be coming out on sections that are going to be almost directly opposite. So if I were to look at that winding inside of there, it's going to be coming out across here. So I can see that my commutator and my brushes, I would be able to go and complete a circuit from something external. Let's draw in a blue resistor over here from brush to brush like that. Uh, if I were to follow this through, I could see that I could go and create current flow that would go through this winding from that winding through my commutator and brushes out to my external load back into my other brush and back to that original winding that it came from. We need to go and create complete loops because otherwise we're not going to be able to have current flow, right? We need complete paths for current flow. Okay, that's our brushes and brush holders. This is another picture of a brush holder over here. They're just showing that brush that's going to go up against my commutator over here. Uh, and this one over here does have a tension arm where I'm going to have this spring that is providing upward sort of tension, which is then going to go and drive this arm down. So it's continuing to push that brush down. You'll see that the brush itself has got on it a couple of leads over here. I'll just highlight those leads. They're going to be what are referred to as the pigtails. They're going to be flexible copper leads permanently attached to the brush over here. And then they're going to give us another point where we can make our attachment for whatever wires we have coming out of this uh, machine. This section is going to be connected to that, so I can take my wires actually off of that screw over there. As this brush wears down, which they do, then what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to go and take this bar and I'm going to be able to move it down to the next notch. And so it'll be pushed a little bit further so I can maintain that pressure up against these. Okay, field poles. Field poles are going to go and provide magnetic field in which my armature will rotate for a DC generator. Um, in a DC machine, depending upon what the usage is, we can either be taking power off of them or we can be putting power into them. For what we're going to talk about with generators, we are going to, in a lot of cases, be taking our power off of the armature, off of the rotor that we are going to have on the inside, although we can flip those around. So I can use them as a excuse me, as a uh, actual magnet on the outside, or I can go and use them as what's going to go and be my low current that I'm going to go and drive off of there. We're going to go and have laminations once again around the outside of our rotor. Those laminations, this is all going to be mounted uh, outside of our rotor onto the actual stationary part there. So I'm going to go and have all those laminations, and I'm going to have coils that are going to go around that. This is a cutaway of that up against the side over here where you can see your individual laminations up top there you can see all those little lines and then I can see that I've got two different types of wires over here I'm going to go and have coarse wires and I'm going to go and have fine wires over here as well uh, these are going to go and give me differing things my fine wires you should see that they're a smaller wire but there's many many more turns my coarse wires you should see is going to go and be fewer turns but it's going to be thicker wire um, these are going to go and give me differing effects on my machine. We're going to talk about series and shunt fields later on. For now, you just need to recognize that the series fields, or just label it inside of yours, these coarse ones here are going to be my series field. These fine ones over here are going to go and be my shunt field. And we'll talk about why they are the way they are, thick or thin wires, later on. Once again, these are going to be varnished uh, coated wires, which means that we don't want those things to go and get heated up because we lose those VOCs, the volatile organic compounds. Okay, moving on then to the actual assembly. This that we're looking at is a cutaway machine and it is clearly for a generator because I'm open on the ends over here so that I can access components and so I can go and uh, make adjustments to get good airflow through it. In a lot of cases, we are going to go and have closed if we are looking at a motor, but once again, as we said, they can be done either way. Uh, we are going to go and have three main components. The first component is going to go and be 
this, which is going to be referred to as the frame or the yoke. And then we are going to go and have these other two components here and here, which are going to be referred to as the end bells or the end shields that are going to be off of here. The end bells or the end shields are going to go and support the armature. Take a look at the armature. It's supported across the bearings inside of these end bells. And the actual stator windings are going to be supported on the yoke. So we need to have both of these together. Last of all, bearings. Uh, common bearings used these days are going to go and be my ball bearings. It's very, very rare that we use anything other than ball bearings. But in some applications, we are uh, forced to just based upon the type of material that we're looking at inside of these. So we do have a couple of others that are going to be referred to as like my sleeve bearings or I can go and have pin bearings, etc. Uh, sleeve bearings are going to just have my shaft riding onto something else. So looking at this one that I have over here, I'm going to go and have a sleeve, which is going to be made up of a softer material than the shaft. And while we want this to be the consumable, that sleeve will usually be like a brass or something like that, and milled extremely smooth with a smooth shaft that's going to go and sit inside of there. And then I'm going to go and lubricate that, oftentimes with a wick type of a thing, or other times I'll go and have something that will throw the oil around, almost like inside of your car engine. Uh, what I'll do is I'll fill the bottom section over here with oil, and then this wick that goes over the top of that is going to continuously go and pull, just using capillary action, pull that oil up, and then that oil is going to be able to go into where it's got its actual mating or its bearing surfaces over here. Um, they do require a lot of maintenance. You're going to go and see these things commonly. They're going to go and have a little cap on the top. It's different than the grease nipple, but it's going to be an actual little cap, or in some cases they will go and have a tube out to the side, and then they will go and have a larger bell. That's terribly drawn. Let me see if I can do better than that. Uh, they're going to go and have a larger bell up top that is just going to, it's going to look like a funnel, and it's going to be off of a rigid metal shaft like that. It's going to have a cap once again, and you just, all you have to do as maintenance is just make sure that there's oil inside of here, because that's all feeding down into here. Can't let these things run dry. As soon as they run dry, you're going to end up with seized bearings. You know, they're going to wear out. You're going to lose uh, your ceiling inside of them and your actual operation. Ball bearings, much more common uh, that we are going to go and have multiple balls rolling around inside of that chase way that we are going to go and have. And ball bearings can either be open or sealed. If you've ever like skateboard or anything like that, you would be very familiar with the concept of sealed bearings where you are going to go and have a casing that's going to be completely covered. Sealed bearings are good when operated within limits. They're going to already have grease inside and the shielding, the seals that are on them will go and prevent other stuff from coming out. But they can, if they break down, they're going to go and lose whatever's inside, and then you're going to go and end up with your bearings that are going to start to go and grind. The other issue with sealed is that if you overrun them, if you don't use them inside of the proper RPM, you know, if you pick something up off the shelf and it says that it is good for 1800 RPM, and you decide that you're going to use it in a 2300 RPM, if you had an open bearing, you could just lubricate to make up for it, but if it's inside of a sealed bearing, if you take that and you rotate it at 2300 RPM, you're going to go and create more speed and more friction. And what it actually does is it creates more heat. And you've got a sealed unit that is under pressure and the heat is going to cause expansion inside there. And you're going to go and end up with ruptures in your case. You know, you're going to just get little leaks because of the intense amount of pressure you will build up inside there. Once you get those ruptures, you're going to lose your grease once again. And these things are going to go and shut down. Do not over grease. There is that little uh, bullet point over there. If you do have anything that has grease nipples on it, you're always putting in one to two pumps. You don't want to keep pressing until you start seeing all the grease, you know, pushing out of the sides. If you are starting to see this grease force out of the side of the bearing, you've blown the seals off of it. Okay. Just a couple of pumps, you know, every now and then is all that that thing needs if you're going to walk around with a grease gun. Okay. That is our intro to DC machines. So once again, Motors and generators are going to be almost the same, except for the casing, which is going to be the big differential off of them. And the commutator, the purpose of our commutator is to be a rotary switch that is going to maintain direction, either for the current that it'll maintain direction, uh, in the case of a generator, or for the magnetic field, which is what it would be maintaining direction for on the motor.